All right. Well, um, it's very, very exciting. Looks like some new folks joining us today. So let me just introduce myself. I'm Mel Hauser, use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director here at All Brains Belong, Vermont. Welcome to Brain Club. Um, so what I will be doing is sharing screen and we'll do our usual introduction to get everyone oriented to our ground rules of community agreement. So we will be discussing today book chat on the book Uniquely Human by Barry Prezant. And don't worry if you haven't read the book. That's the thing about book chats um, here at All Brains Belong. Uh, we, we don't expect anyone to read the book. The, read the book. So we're going to be joined by, um, joined asynchronously by a panel of community members, um, all uh, uh, sharing sharing their perspectives on the book. We'll also we also have a video clip from Dr. Prasant talking about the book, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. But first, community agreement. All forms of participation are okay here. So, as many of you have already figured out, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we do not expect anything of you. We certainly do not expect you to look at the camera. You can feel free to walk, move, stim, fidget, eat, leave, come back, and everyone is welcome. And all communication is welcome. So you can, and, and all forms of communication are welcome. So you can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat box. You can, you know, whatever, whatever, however you are comfortable communicating is all welcome here. Um, and uh, speaking of communication, I'll just say a word about language. You'll hear um, me tonight and maybe other people using identity first language as we discuss autism. Um, because for me, um, autism is part of my identity. Um, so I will say that I am an autistic person. Um, and so if it, 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 anyone else um, who uh, uh, uses whatever language you use to describe yourself and your, you know, whatever terms that, that are how you describe your own self, you are welcome to use those terms. And um, uh, in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, it's really important to us that we respect and protect one another's access needs. So access needs being anything that anyone needs to fully and meaningfully participate. Um, and um, I'll also say that today is for education purposes only. We will not be giving medical advice. And uh, speaking of access needs, um, these are the, uh, the, the additional considerations uh, informed by our community advisory board to just acknowledge that we all have a broad range of communication access needs. Um, we, many of us have the kinds of brains that don't feel the passing of time. Um, and, um, you know, I think that noting that uh, when we have access needs that conflict, for example, I have the kind of brain that like will run on for like 20 minutes without taking a breath. And um, that may not be creating space for other people to, to dialogue. And so um, just normalizing that, naming that, that we're going to, you know, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a facilitator, that I'm going to try to take take lots of space to to and pausing for processing so that everyone can participate uh, who wants to be although uh, of course no no direct pressure to to um, to, to, to chime in um, but we want to be able to create space for people um, to join the conversation last bit of access so if uh, closed captioning is already enabled you just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it so depending on what version of Zoom you have, either um, clicking the live transcript, closed captioning button, or uh, if you don't see that, you can click the more dot, dot, dot and choose show subtitles. And then if you wanna turn them off, do the same thing and choose hide subtitles. Okay, all righty. So the book we'll be discussing tonight, Uniquely Human by Dr. Barry Prezant, um, was um, you know, when it when it was first released, and there's been a couple of versions that have come up now, but initially um, written and, and published in 2015, it was um, a paradigm shift. Um, 2015 was a long time ago. And this book that has now, you know, by 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 by, by this point, this is um, I, I I think the the, uh, the 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 best selling book about autism since it came out. Um, and you know the winner of a number a number of awards 
um, and is uh, Liz, Lizzie pointed out today is, is also the highest, high, you know, best selling book on Amazon, you know, year after year after year. Anyway, um, relating to autism. And so, like, when we think back to 2015, um, though it was, you know, it, it, a long time ago and yet not that long ago, it was ahead of its time as far as introducing a paradigm shift, talking about how, you know, autism is not a disorder. Autism is a different way of being wired. And um, this was one of the first books to advocate for shifting to a focus on strengths and building relationships, seeking to understand autistic behavior and not to control and try to extinguish it. And um, a, 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 a large portion of the book was informed by interviews with autistic people, elevating the value of lived experience. And so, um, and, and, and it was, it was also um, one of the first books um, written for a mainstream audience of parents and educators um, that, that used identity first language. And that was, that was new. And so um, one, 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 of, one of the things that comes up sometimes is that, you know, yeah, are there, you know, a, 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 how, how has the dialogue evolved since 2015? Well, it's evolved significantly um, as the emergence of the neurodiversity movement. Um, and, um, but this, this book uh, really, really was um, ahead of its time. So as we, um, uh, the first thing we'll do is, uh, is, is, is watch a brief clip um, interview with Dr. Prezant um, uh, in, in 2023, um, uh, talking, talking about, about neurodiversity. Um, and many thanks to Dr. Alyssa Minkin, um, host of the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association podcast, um, uh, for sharing this interview with us. All right, David, take it away. Hi, you need to turn off screen sharing. I can't do it while you're doing it. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. There you go. All right. I had to slightly edit it down to size because um, I can't stream it right from YouTube, but so it'll just take me one second here. Hopefully it's in the right order. Here you go. Um. I also want to talk more about neurodiversity because we mentioned it at the beginning and we didn't really explain. I think there's a neurodiversity lens as opposed to a pathology lens. And yes. this is what I wish healthcare professionals, educators could get. Yes. Talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. Yeah. And, and I'm going to quote the name of Mel's um, group that she's formed. It's called All Brains Belong. I well, love all it. Brains are awesome from here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and what a neurodiversity lens appreciates is that every person is wired differently. Um, every person therefore perceives the world differently, experiences emotions differently, experiences sensations differently, um, is good at some things, not so good at other things. So it's kind of anti-pathologizing because we've looked at people good at some things and not so good at other things. And we've said that person is deficient or we label it a disorder. Now, I'm not talking about serious medical illnesses here, okay? Yeah, or serious behavior problems, which we, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, but, but even people who are, for example, highly anxious, okay? Um, or people who have bipolar um, and may have serious kind of problem behaviors because of that. Um, you know, there we're talking about in some cases, medication may be helpful because the source is a neurochemical source or maybe a source of seizures um, might be the source of behavior that's just harmful to self, harmful to others. What we're talking about is literally every person, you and I, have kind of a profile of things we're very good at, things we're okay at, things we're lousy at, we'll never be good at, okay? And we need to make changes in work settings, in society, to accommodate for people's differences so that everybody could have a good quality of life and be successful. So let me give an example of my wife. My wife does not, she's not on the spectrum. She does not have an identified quote unquote disability. 
Thanks, David. You're um, welcome. So just to, just to, just to catch up in the chat, uh, I just uh, uh, so think um, uh, I I I just shared that um, you know uh, really an 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 an, an honor uh, to to hear Dr. Prezant ma uh, mention the work that we're doing here at All Brains Belong, and uh, thank you to everyone in the chat who 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 share who shared the enthusiasm. Um, so uh, with with that, um, oh thank you, Mary. Um, uh, with that, um, um, I'm now going to uh, transition right into our community panel. Let me share screen. Um, so, um, uh, uh, Hannah Bloom, uh, occupational therapist, works with children and adults, um, uh, is also a member of our board of directors. Jen Bryant, a returning panelist, special educator here in Montpelier. And then I'm a panelist. I've never been a Brain Club panelist before. Sarah, Sarah interviewed me, um, I'm a, uh, which, was, which was really fun to do. So this, this, uh, this will run about 15 minutes and we'll have the, um, the chat rolling while we watch. And so, and then we'll have plenty, plenty of time for discussion. All right, David, I'm gonna. Stop share, you can reshare and we'll get going. All right, so we're here today talking to Hannah about Uniquely Human by Dr. Barry Pazan. Seems like trust is a big theme of this book and um, building trust with the kiddos that you interact with through your work as an occupational therapist. The core of occupational therapy is to be a part of a team that the individual creates with themselves in it that creates meaningful occupation and um, participation and quality of life, explores that as the, what does that look like for me as an individual, as a unique human in this, big world. Without trust as the base of that, as a team member, um, my participation in that team, at best, it's perfunctory and like, whatever, just go away, you non-functional person on the team. And at worst, it's traumatic because as the OT, there's a possibility that I would come in and give these, like, do these things. And I, without trust, there's just, there's no reason that my direction should be there like when i read this book when luna was about um two and a half shortly after her autism diagnosis i read this book and i was like oh that makes sense um and it really put me on a journey like building on what i had learned from self-reg by stuart shanker about nervous system regulation and co-regulation this was the next step the cognitive piece of being a detective to wonder why one of the questions that we're asking panelists is whether um, you see this come up in your practice in terms of developing and building trust as being essential. It seems to be a, a, a big theme of this book um, in terms of the children that you interact with on a daily basis. This is not a kid thing. This is an every human thing. Everyone needs to feel safe. Um, trust and safety come first for people of all ages. How do I cue safety, which we talk a lot about? How do I, how do I invite another person into connection with me? How do I get myself invited into their connection? Because I have to work to get invited in. Um, and then once that's happened, how do I show up? Uh, in authenticity and in belief enough times that 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 nervous system now trusts my nervous system. you know as a teacher are there ways that you work on building um you know sort of a sphere of trust with the children that you work with yeah it's gonna sound a little cheesy but i think being uniquely human kind of does that so i am my own self with each kid that i work with yeah um, and i listen to who each student is I really truly think that kids can feel when you authentically care about them and are happy to have meaningful conversations with them and listen to who they are and what they need and yeah. what they want to tell you. Yeah. 
what when I another thing that seemed to come out of the book was the idea of sort of digging beneath behaviors, you know, looking at behaviors. And this is where it sort of reminded me a little bit of, you know, Ross Green and, and collaborative proactive solutions and the idea of like the behavior is just the signal. It's just the fever, you know, like Dr. Green says, um, kind of digging beneath that and looking at, you know, what's going on underneath. Does that resonate with you? It definitely does. And I think um, I love Ross Green of looking at those lagging skills. And I love looking at those skills where they're flourishing as well. Yeah. And that book really did bring that up. Um, so I think when we work to eliminate behaviors without understanding their purpose, behaviors that are signals that we need something and need that's not met. He really went into it in the book talking about being a detective and how it was our job to do that. There was one story that I felt was so fitting because I do have students where I never can quite figure out what it is that is causing an issue. And it was a story about um, driving through a neighborhood and one of the buildings reminded him, the student of something else. And the parents were able to piece that together. But so often when we have little pieces of who a student is, it's hard to piece those together for sure. Can you talk to me a little bit more about, you know, your beliefs around behaviors and how they present and what that means. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the information given to me by another nervous system is always at, at, when I have access to it, which, which I do and work a lot <laughs> is met with curiosity. Um, and it's very much met with like, okay, hmm, something is, something is being communicated to me that I, that I need to understand because I'm the, because I'm the adult, because I'm the professional, because I'm in the role of, 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 of figuring this out, of being a part of this, that, that is coming to it with genuine curiosity and, and presumed competence and belief in, in meaningful occupation and belief in participation. So if I'm getting communication that something is not gelling within this other nervous system, that's the curiosity of like, the, the task analysis, the little Rolodex in my head that I start to go through. What are some ways that you um, dig beneath behaviors when you're looking at somebody's behaviors, behaviors? So somebody does a thing and I automatically ask to myself first, I wonder why that's happening. And like, as a parent, I learned that from this book. What are the factors in the environment? Um, or actually, like, I think, like, rewinding of, like, the algorithm of, like, what goes on up there is, like, I see behavior um, and I presume dysregulation. I just presume it. It's, like, that would not have happened if that person were regulated. So I, then I wonder, why are they dysregulated? Um, I wonder, what are the factors of the environment? Um, what are the cognitive aspects? What were the expectations? What are the access needs that are not met? Like the interpersonal, um, you know, the interpersonal access needs. And then um, I find a way to like, uh, you know, I hypothesis test about that. And then I like check whether I'm correct when the person's regulated. I might make some comment like, or in, I noticed in the middle of the night that you flipped your lid. I wonder if it's because you were expecting daddy to transport you to your room and that didn't happen. And then my six-year-old might tell me yes or no, whether I'm correct, but this is like a debrief. It's like, a, it's, a, it's like the see behavior, wonder why, hypothesis form, test hypothesis. Like that's how my algorithm works. You know, I really like the double empathy piece that's come into conversation a lot lately too like all right we're we're all human and 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 this nervous system has had a day where they're taxed and that's totally a part of the reality of of walking this earth um in community um and you know kind of breaking away from having that 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 like spotlight on one person <laughs> that that really like diffuse that light and like yeah a lot of people are having hard dates and on we go, hold space for that, allow it to be there um, and accept it as, as a part of, of the communication of the day. Um, you know, and then not to discount when those behaviors are, are things that are painful 
self-injurious behaviors, like when those behaviors become things that attention needs to be given to, then absolutely we dive deeper as a team and say, what's the function of this behavior? You know, why are, why are we picking at our lips until they bleed? Why are we picking at our cuticles till they bleed? Why are we smashing our head with our fist in, in response to things like those behaviors and others? Absolutely. That becomes the part where there is a reason for the algorithm for the model where it says this thing needs to change. How do we change the environment to affect this behavior? How do we change the expectations to change this behavior? What are the things in this orbit that can help provide safety when this behavior is, is unsafe? So I would say that trust is an essential ingredient for safety and safety comes first, right? So like, if you don't feel safe within the context of a relationship, nothing else happens. Like, so, you know, safety, then engagement, then communication, then et cetera, et cetera. Like, if you don't feel safe, nothing else happens. And so what I see in my practice, people of all ages don't feel safe. Luna would be just like constantly flipping her lid. And I read in Uniquely Human, this example of having like a board that told the child in the book, like where, where their person was. So like we had, we, we, de we developed like a daddy board and we would like write what room of the house daddy is in at all times. And like just doing that to signal safety, that went such a hugely far away because at any given time, Luna could refer to the daddy board on the, refer to the daddy board on the refrigerator. And like, you know, and we just had an arrow of like upstairs or downstairs, what floor of the house is daddy on? And like that, helped regulation tremendously. There was a portion of the book where they talked about classifying typical autistic behaviors as autistic behaviors. And he spoke to a group in the book, if I'm remembering it correctly, mm -hmm. and asked, what kind of behaviors are you talking about? And it was things like, well, flapping. And he was saying, well, when I get anxious, they tap my feet or mm, talking to yourself. And it was another person who said, you know, I also talk to myself all the time when I'm thinking things through or when I'm cleaning. And so many of the behaviors that we label as autistic behaviors really are just common human behaviors that we're all doing. And we do use them to regulate, but with this idea that we do that ourselves in private or that we, that it's wrong. And so we don't show those feelings. And when we think of this as a way for students to regulate, we stop looking at things like bouncing on the rug during morning meeting or like not gazing into your eyes or looking at you, those aren't necessarily signs that a student isn't engaged and isn't learning. Those are signs that a student is regulating their body so that they can be attending and so that they can be learning. And I think it's so important to remember that. Um, I think that so much we get stuck in changing. And this, I mean, Uniquely Human was so wonderful about kind of affirming this and giving it giving it language. We, we so much want to, um, change the individual to fit in our perceptions of the world. And if we can look at the world as a wonderfully diverse and expansive place and then community as that, then how do we create the environment that allow the individual to be uniquely who they are? And I want that for myself. And so yeah. why not give that as a, as a base of it for, for, for everybody we interact with? Um, the other part that I thought was really huge was uh, just one line in the book that I thought really resonated and it was talking about um, rather than autism spectrum disorder, that idea of neurotypical spectrum disorder, where it's really easy to ask um, that perspective taking from autistic people of why people do things. So explaining, oh, he said that, but he didn't really mean it. And when you look at it the other way, it's, but why would you say it if you didn't mean it? So that kind of perspective taking from both sides and looking at the idea that both neurotypical and neurodivergent people have different ways of expressing things. And not all of the ways that neurotypical humans express things really make sense. It's a book that I've looked back on and reflected on in my own practice and in my own life. And um, 
really taking a skill-based viewpoint and um, some of the things that came from it were huge and there were parts that I didn't love and it's a nice reminder that this was written quite a while ago and we've learned and as we get new information and learn more we put that to use so we're so much further along now in our understanding of what um, what is expected and what is appreciated within all of society that I think we're looking now at these uniquely human humans all around us. After I read this book, I bought a bunch of copies of it and gave it to everyone working with my child. I did that for years. You know, just, and there's a lot about the intentionality of how I work and how I, I feel like OT has the capacity to, to work where it's I find joy in the joy of whatever is happening in the moment. Like it can be, and the range of things all hold the same amount of, uh, the same amount of joy. Vacuum cleaners to Pokemon cards, to fairy houses, to world politics. All of those things, the joy is actually in for me, the joy is in finding the, the person who's finding joy in the activity or the topic or the action. Um, and that's, that just, that, that creates a connection. I'm so happy that you are happy about these things. And I want to know more about that happiness and that joy. All these years later, it's still just incredible to me how many professionals don't see the world this way and they don't have this paradigm it's not the way they were trained and like we wonder why there's chaos right because safety comes first and if the this ba the, the 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 basic paradigm through which you see the world ultimately has a huge implication for the relationship if you are seeing someone through a deficit-based lens they feel it and they're not gonna feel safe with you So that ending, right, that's that's building on the conversation we had a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the impact of stigma on autistic health. And Lizzie, can you throw the, um, the link to the recording to that in the chat? Um, because I think that that is that like, you know, the, the lens of uniquely human is the opposite of that right so when you view someone through a, a, a through a lens of you know pathology that how could that not impact your relationship and how could that not um and so i think that um thanks lizzie um uh thanks amy um so i i i, I just want to um there's been uh, just a lot of conversation in the in in the chat um uh, that that I that I can I catch us up, but but I first I just want to want to open it up to what's what's uh, what's standing out for anyone after um, either 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 uh, you know <laughs> directly or indirectly related because of course all all everything's connected to everything so whatever thoughts are coming to mind they are welcome here. Kelly, go for it. Hey, sorry, I'm painting, so that's why my camera was off. But um, working with other professionals that were trained a long time ago, I've talked about this before, leads to some frustrating moments. What would you recommend or what would anyone recommend as kind of a gateway piece of literature, like, I thought about using uniquely human. I also thought about using sincerely your autistic child. Um, do you have any recommendations for a gateway piece of literature that you think would introduce things in a way that would be less likely to make people defensive and more likely to make people listen? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think I, I, I think uniquely human is um, an example of, I think, um, something that professionals who are at least open to learning um, may be able to connect with. 
I also think that you could approach this like zooming way out, not necessarily talking about autism specifically, is that um, I, 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 I think many professionals accept the premise that we're always learning new information. So when we talk about the brain science of um, of, of nervous system regulation. So, you know, a book like, and I'm, I made a, I made a reference to this in, in my comments, the book Self-Reg by Stuart Shanker, um, um, about the, you know, the, the physical, emotional, cognitive, social, pro-social triggers and, um, and, and regulating variables, um, for an individual, um, or Beyond Behaviors by Mona Delahook. I think it's really about, um, you know, like this, this, this is new. It's not new. It's always been like this since the dawn of time, but these are books that like present brain science um, so that, um, you know, it's like, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't, it's the oblique angle where you don't tell the people you're doing it wrong. You just, you learned this new information that you, it's so exciting and it's new and we can apply it. So that. I'm just reading, uh, Ali says, frustration that the attempt at helping others who are different has led to the pathological lens that dehumanizes so many of us. So grateful that we have communities like ABB that are shifting the paradigm. Thank you. Steve says, um, one caveat, not all behaviors are autistic. Neurodivergent children do simply misbehave, and that's a wonderful thing. Right, it's developmental. Um, it is a, it's part of human growth, and often the problem is that professionals cannot parse the difference. And Ali adds to that, that when you label someone, it's so easy to view all their behaviors from the narrow lens of a problem. Yes. And it also becomes, you know, people talk about self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's energetic. If I enter a space and someone is judging me through a negative lens, um, I feel that. And it's not only that I fulfilled a prophecy, it's that I'm dysregulated by the prophecy. Um, so like you, you think that about me, I feel it and it hurts me and I'm much more likely to be dysregulated. And again, we talk about this a lot at Brain Club is that when um, the, um, uh, sorry, uh, Kelly, I'll come to Jim, 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 Sim, uh, Jim Sinclair in, in just a minute. Thank you for bringing that up. I'm going to um, pull, I'll, 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 I'll pull up um, his famous piece that I can link in the chat. Um, but um, we talk a lot about at Brain Club that uh, we're talking about a lot. Brain! <laughs> um, I don't remember. Um, it was, what was I saying? Anybody? Is that you view someone dysregulated? Oh man, it's going to be one of those. Well, you were days. saying about you know you get dysregulated and it leads to fulfilling the prophecy, even though you weren't there to begin with. But maybe you've gone on beyond that. You felt thanks, what they were June. Feeling. Yeah, you felt what they were feeling towards you. Yeah, that. Um, I think that um, when 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 that happens and we have these on. Oh, I remember. Thank you, Mary. I got June and Mary together. You like support. Thank you for supporting all that goes on up there or doesn't go on up there. Um, is that um, we hold downstairs brain to the standards of upstairs brain. Where we are in, um, you know, meaning, so this is uh, using Dr. Dan Siegel and Dr. Tina Payne Bryson's model, where the cortex is upstairs brain, the limbic system is downstairs brain, the limbic system is involuntary, automatic reactions to what's happening in the environment. And so downstairs brain having a, re a reaction to being uh, interacted with through a deficit-based lens. And what happens? Um, behavior is as ascribed to like, you know, a calculated decision of like, should I throw that toy? Um, it's not like, a, oh, you know, what are the pros and cons of throwing that toy? Um, you know, oh man, I'm not gonna get my sticker on my sticker chart if I throw that toy, I'm gonna do it anyway. That's not happening at all. People are under threat and limbic system is reacting.
Christina says, um, I think sometimes even when we think about people in a growth lens, we have to be careful to not have the view that if only they could improve this thing, they would be better. It's often better to accept them where they are and support their own exploration. Right. Yeah. I think that um, when, 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 uh, whenever we are sending the message implicitly or explicitly that there's something that is fundamental about a person that needs to be changed, there are many nervous systems who experience that as threat. Even if it is not, you know, it's, it's even if it's well-intended of like, I wish you could dress yourself or I wish you could do the thing like that is experienced by many nervous systems as a threat. And as Ali said, kids pick up on that, this lack of hope for their future and it feeds that self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. But we talk about so often presuming competence um, for, for, for all people um, at all times, for all ages. Um, and and that that all too often is um, it's, it's it's presuming competence. It's presuming good intent. So, you know, it's like Dr. Ross Green says that kids do well if they can. I shared that um, that line with Luna the other day uh, for the first time, and um, and and she like she's six, and it meant something um, of like yeah when this thing happened your access needs were not met, and then you know later when we debrief things it's like let's think about what what was upsetting about that and what could have made it better for you. Luna, uh, I'm Lu Laura. I just called you Luna. That just happened. That was the biggest honor ever to be mistaken as Luna for a second. <laughs> um, so Mel, one of the things that I find when I'm talking to professionals who are new to this paradigm is that that's a great lens for the so-called high-functioning autistic, and they separate out this as though we're talking about something completely different when we're talking about people who have a higher level of disability. Um, do you have a response that you use when people, like I kind of just talk about, you know, we're really talking about the same picture and dysregulation and that kind of thing, but I'm, I'm wondering how you respond to things like that or if you see that. What, we're, what we know now um, is that functioning labels are unhelpful and that, that for, for, for all of these nervous systems, um, there are fluctuating capacities depending on um, the demands from the environment and the demands and the cognitive load on that brain. I say something like that. Um, I wonder if, because uh, I know there's a lot, a lot of people who probably encounter this in various realms. Uh, what, do, what do we say when we hear a professional use an outdated um, paradigm that is not rooted in brain science related to functioning labels? Mel, I also hear it from a decent number of parents when I present research that say like, that's great, but it doesn't apply to my child. And they sort of give this alternate view that's totally unrelated. I don't know if you see that with any. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, I actually also see it with, I mean, there's, there's, um, there, there, there are people that, um, there are some people that as part of their self-discovery of their own neurodivergence, that sometimes there is like an elitism, um, that, that people kind of ascribe to or incorporate. And um, it's it's like we talk about at Brain Club a lot is that you, you don't challenge brain rules. Um, so if somebody, and what I mean by brain rules is it's something a brain made up. It's not like it's a law of physics. So if somebody, if there's, you know, a, a, a you know, if someone has a narrative of like, this is the, the, what I have to tell myself to make my world make sense. And you're challenging that, that's not going to get there. So that narrative needs to be um, amended by the person. Um, and so it's about strewing the content um, and they will take of it um, what, what they will. Um, uh, you know, for, for, for uh, what, what I can say is that when people, um, like, but I'll, I'll just give a personal example. Cause again, I, 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 I am agreeing, uh, with, with Annika, um, uh, saying quote, high functioning is a trigger word for me because, um, especially since I finally understand that that label was what led me to not receive support that I really needed as a child. 
um, that is absolutely um, so common. Um, so anyway, when I'm in, I remember once attending, um, there's a, 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 a group um, uh, where men, there, there were several autistic adults who were themselves using functioning labels. So I raised my hand and I said, the week I got my autism diagnosis, so, uh, the, the week I got my autism diagnosis, I lost the motor planning skills to brush my teeth. Like mic drop. Um, I, I'm a physician. Um, so like that is it's that's the story that I think that um, you, you you're providing evidence. Um, you're strewing it and then people will pick up what they're able to make meaning of. Um, but what we know is that um, uh, functioning labels are wrong. And we we and 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 the fluctuating nature of support needs um, is 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 more common than not. Yeah, I, I think also on the other side of that, if we use the word low functioning, if we're trying to like describe people, it kind of, you know, limits their or or skews their ability to um, show up the way that they would like to show up too. It's like a double-edged sword because Absolutely. if somebody can't, aren't, isn't communicating the way that you expect, you know, people to communicate doesn't mean that they can't and cognitive abilities, communicative abilities, those are all separate categories. And I think we shouldn't lump them into one functioning label like we sometimes do. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, it's it using a label like low functioning is the opposite of presuming competence. Steve says, it's okay to show that we can be successful. Um, which is way different than this this functioning business. Yes, and I think that what we would want to see is we'd want to see that everyone has their access needs met. And we know that so many neurodivergent people um, don't have their access needs met. Um, and I'm um, reading, just catching up in the chat, Lillian says, the linear view of autism is so misleading. There is some not cool discussion about embedding language for separating people who need more support right now um, uh, and a uh, trigger warning for the label profound autism. And that is um, uh, there, there, that, that controversy um, uh, coming out from, from researchers advocating this lens is being met with huge resistance from many members of the autistic community. Yeah, and as CB says, ranking functioning is so dehumanizing. Yes, could not agree more. And I think that um, it's one of the things I think about both as a parent of an autistic child and you know as a doctor taking care of autistic people of all ages is that like talking about the fluctuating support needs is really important. Um, because uh, when you have the kind of brain that derives safety from predictable systems, we it, it it's it's actually can be quite dysregulating when someone is not it's you've not normalized a culture of interdependence. Um, you've you've glorified independence, and now someone needs more support, and there's not a framework for that of how normal that is. Um, that can be really that can be really hard. So I like to talk about that with with really all children. Um, I, and and you know even with my my patients who are typically developing, I'm like trying to like screw these comments of like we all have different brains, we all have things that come easily, things that come hard. When things are hard, it's okay to ask for help. It's normal. Christina says, I really only feel like I share myself on quote. Uh, functioning days because I have this internal stigma, right? The internalized ableism on the quote, not functioning days. Um, Ali says functioning should be determined by the individual's perspective of their quality of life, not their ability to meet society's expectations. Amen to that. Yes. 
Steve says, if hyperlexia leads you to have difficulty communicating with others, how is that functionally different than aphasia? I don't know, but I wonder how is that different than echolalia? So let's just grab the echolalia piece. So just a little bit of jargon busting. Um, echolalia is um, uh, re refers to repeating um, sounds. Um, and so uh, uh, the idea, and this could be immediate, um, and there are so many people who have no idea that they are echolalic. There are adults and they're listening to you in conversation and they repeat your last word back to you to show that they're listening. Echolalia. Um, so like that's common. Um, and uh, that there, that, 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 so, so then there's delayed echolalia. And there's a lot of people who they are processing language as like chunks and scripts. Um, so, uh, you know, um, I, 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 I and, and whether that be, Lizzie says, I realized I was doing delayed echolalia today. Um, and it says, I really, I recently noticed that I repeat back synonyms. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so I think that, you know, like the, this is just, this, 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 this is, this is common. And I think that there are, um, you know, just there's, there's you know, actually, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a story that I'm not proud of. Um, Luna's new thing is that she likes to watch videos of herself as a, a baby and a toddler. And we watch this together when she's falling asleep, like things that we've collected in like an app that we've kept track over time. And we're watching these things. And I am remembering back then when I was, um, you know, an unrecognized autistic parent. Um, and there were things that she did that were so worrisome to me um, that, um, and I'll tell her about that with the lens of, I didn't know. I didn't know how you were making sense of the world. And when I think about how for so long she was communicating with, with echolalia, they were in the form of like, you know, even like, you know, two, two syllables of a chunk that went together. And she was communicating, she was communicating so much with these things. But in the moment, I remember freaking out of like, catastrophizing of all of the like the ways that kids would bully her. She was two. And I think this is what goes on for a lot of people. And I think that one of the, um, you know, uh, Dr. Virginia Spielman, who is the uh, the executive director of the Star Institute, we once had a conversation and uh, about how um, one of the reasons that um, internalized ableism has has so much purchase is about the you know the unrecognized neurodivergent parent of the neurodivergent child who sees something that reminds them of what of their own experience and their own trauma and so desperately wants to shut that down. And I think that part of the unlearning, the self-regulation as an adult is, 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 is the healing required um, it, in order to not be driving that lens of, I need to change you and fix you because it's a trauma response for a lot of people. Uh, Laura uh, and Sarah says, yes, and it's often unconscious on the part of the parent, right? So it's like bringing self-awareness, like self-awareness is the first step and you can't make someone have self-awareness. They have to, I mean, maybe you can for some people, but like there's a lot of people for whom um, if, you know, someone making an interpretation about them is a threat. Like, so it's, it's, it's about, it's someone who's open to learning and collects information and applies it on their own terms. Laura says, um, it's so helpful to hear because internalized ableism is a constant undoing process. And it's helpful to recognize that it comes from a place of love and that it needs to be corrected. Both can be true, right? It's radical acceptance. Um, and I think that like shifting, shifting butts to ends um, is like, a really important part of being a human who's constantly learning and unlearning. Christina says, for sure, I have very undiagnosed neurodivergent parents that tried the fixing. Yup. Yup, yup. 
Um, just uh, scrolling up, Lillian says, the other misleading thing is, quote, intellectual disability um, uh, based on IQ testing. Yeah, IQ testing is just bogus for lots and lots of lots of people. Um, and, uh, and, and Lillian's also sharing specifically because of motor, motor um, uh, differences that it is like these tests are not, they're, they're, they're not actually valid for a lot of people. Um, uh, Steve says, as an educator, I have to expend a lot of energy on forgiving myself for screw-ups with students I didn't understand. Steve, like, let's pause there, because that's, like, a really important piece of healing for, I think, a lot of people in this community, right? So, like, part of being on a journey of learning and unlearning together is that acknowledging that we only we only know what we know at a given time and it does consume a lot of energy to like you know I should have done different I should like you did what you you know we all do what we do at the time because that's the scope we have and being on a journey of learning and unlearning now you have a different perspective I think we all do so thank you for sharing that and uh, because I think that I mean that resonates with me a lot that's I mean that's the story I just shared about the Luna and the watching of the videos thing Kelly says, I remember getting really upset during my son's assessment. They kept pointing out things that I do and calling them wrong. I, keep def I kept defending them by saying that he's with me all day, so it makes sense that he would pick up my traits. Pretty annoying that no one said anything right then. You mean in terms of uh, that that was an opportunity to, to learn that you were autistic earlier? Is that what you mean by that, Kelly? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because again, Many so many professionals are trained in stereotypes, and um, it's 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 like we talked about at Brain Club a couple weeks ago. Um, all of the people who have a you know a, this 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 long delay in understanding how their brains work is because the professionals don't know. Um, and when we think about, you know, presuming competence and how many professionals do not presume competence, there's like, it's a trade-off. Um, there was this one time um, uh, somebody I was working with um, was having a really hard time accessing what they need in school. And they were, um, they, they, they were um, not being given opportunities that were, um, you know, within their self-determined um, future goals. Um, and I remember like crying, I like cried with my patient of like the realization that they were being denied opportunities because it was known they were autistic, like that that was a difference between me and them in that moment of like, the only difference is that no one knew I was autistic. So I had opportunities and that's messed up. And just like the sheer urgency of shifting that, um, is 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 real and um uh i i share annika's observation and ali's um uh, uh observation of that um the idea that professionals would refer to a behavior as wrong um is it's part of the problem it's the and and and, and again the impact of that stigma that judgment that presumed, um, you know, the 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 neuro majority that the, you know the view the view that there's one correct way to play to communicate to be a human like that's not a thing, and yet society all too often gives those messages. Um, and so uh, with uh, uh, and Lillian shares, there's a need to educate even uh, within within the autism community. I was uh, on an email exchange um, with an autistic person um, who was endorsing the profound autism category. Um, but again, there is um, and, and Lillian's sharing the the the, the difficulties that um, you know um, non non speaking or minimally speaking um, people. There are assumptions made about um, a, 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 about competence, and it's bogus. Um, and so you know when uh, you know taking taking time to read the you know the 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 the, the writings um, of. Um, non-speaking individuals, um, you know, these are the stories being told of what it, what the impact is of, of feeling um, like they're 
not being, not, that competence is not being presumed. And so actually I'll mention um, that the book that we're gonna do a book chat in for May um, is the reason I jump um, and uh, that, that I think will be a, uh, a powerful, powerful discussion. Um, what I'll also say is that um, uh, as, we, as we wrap up April and head into May, May's theme for Brain Club is uh, the neurodivergent experiences. Um, and so neurodivergent experiences are going to capture a lot of, um, we've got some pre-recorded community panels talking about things like burnout. I think, Sarah, is burnout next week or the week after? Anyway, neurodivergent burnout, I think- Burnout, my burnout is next week, yep. Okay, so neurodivergent burnout next week. This was requested by this group, so uh, we're doing it, um, and, um, I, and 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 a range of other topics. Um, so uh, uh, with uh, with with that, um, I really appreciate the conversation today. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, and if you are not, um, uh, if if if. If you're not, if you were not registered for Brain Club tonight, Lizzie, you know, we forgot to do, um, maybe if you could put, if, if you'd like us to be sending you a link with the registration link for May Brain Club, if you registered for April, you're going to get it, you're in the system already, but if you were not registered and you, and, and, and uh, you, you, uh, anyway, just stick your email address in the chat and we'll make sure to get you the link for, for May Brain Club. Um, and uh, uh, Steve, I, I, I agree that chat is uh, where the action is. Um, but, but, um, but, 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 but also that we, you know, we, we, there's a lot of action in the chat and, you know, um, multi multiple ways of doing the thing that, you know, you're engaging in the chat, you're engaging um, by, you know, speaking out loud, you're engaging by, um, you know, observation, because observation is a totally valid um, form of participation and normalizing that for all people as early as possible um, is, is part of neuro-inclusive community. So yes, I agree, Sarah, you're engaging by being here and, uh, and, and, and you're valued by being here. So thank you all so much. Have a good night. <laughs>